Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, for those who may not know me, my name is Daniel Haran, and I'm a professor of philosophy, religious studies, and theology. And I have the privilege of serving as the director of the Center for Spirituality here at St. Mary's College. I'm so delighted to welcome you this afternoon to this Ex Libris Author Lecture Series event. And we extend a special uh, note of welcome to those joining us virtually in the live stream and to our in-person people. I don't want to neglect you, too. We're glad you're here as well. Just a note about the Center for Spirituality. It was founded in 1984 with the generous support from the Sisters of the Holy Cross. And we're delighted that some of the sisters are with us here virtually and in person this evening. The Center for, this, for Spirituality offers programs that promote the engagement between faith and reason and the connection between mind, body, and spirit. A hub for scholarly and public engagement, we draw on intellectual resources in the Catholic and broader Christian heritage, as well as how individuals practice faith in their daily lives to develop critical conversations around contemporary religious issues, especially as they relate to women's experiences in society the academy, and the church. Before we proceed with our exciting event this afternoon, we wish to acknowledge that we are gathering on sacred land and wish to honor the native peoples who have been the traditional custodians of this place for generations. We particularly recognize the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi, as well as the Miami, who have cared for this land and its resources for many generations and continue to do so today. It's with deep gratitude we recognize these Native peoples and their cultures within our community, as well as acknowledging the land upon which we gather, pray, learn, and work. Just a note about the format for our program this afternoon. It's threefold. First, Dr. Bugish will offer a brief presentation about her work. Next, my colleague, Dr. Julia Fetter, who is an Associate Professor of Theology at Creighton University, and we are so delighted and honored that she is serving as project coordinator this year at the Center for Spirituality. She will engage in conversation on the themes of Dr. Bogish's work uh, after the presentation. And finally, we will open the floor for questions and comments from both our in-person and our virtual audience. For those joining us virtually, feel free to use the Q&A button or enter your question in the chat. And now it's my privilege to introduce our guest today. Dr. Katie Ann Marie Bogish is Associate Professor in the Program of Liberal Studies at the University of Notre Dame. She is a historian of Christian theology, liturgical practice, and material culture, who is particularly interested in reconstructing the lived experiences of religious women in the Middle Ages through their documents of practice and other material remains. She is the author of The Care of Nuns, Benedictine Women's Ministries in England During the Central Middle Ages, as displayed right here, which was awarded the American Society of Church History's Brewer Prize in 2020 for outstanding scholarship in the history of Christianity by a first-time author, no small feat. She's also co-editor of Women Intellectuals and Leaders in the Middle Ages, as well as the volume Medieval Cantors and Their Craft, Music, Liturgy, and the Shaping of History. She has been a Mellon Fellow at the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies in Toronto, and the Joy Foundation Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She is currently working on a book tentatively titled Sybil de Felton and Barking Abbey, Leadership, Literacy, and Liturgy in Late Medieval England. So please join me in extending a warm St. Mary's College welcome to a dear friend of St. Mary's College, Dr. Katie Bush. What a pleasure it is to be with all of you this evening. I really hope that you all considered me to be a friend of St. Mary's College. This is a very dear place to me, especially the Sisters of the Holy Cross that are present here this evening and also virtually. I grew up desperately seeking a place where only my mothers, my sister, and I could be released from the constraints forced upon us by too many of the men in our lives father, teachers, coaches, and others who tried to define who we should be. My best efforts were never enough to satisfy their expectations. I always somehow fell short of the mark. Hounding feelings of inadequacy. 
sorry, no, that just went up. Hounding feelings of inadequacy drove me elsewhere in search of a sanctuary for women. All too fleeting experiences of reprieve in my mother's embrace, in my sister's company, and most especially in the haven of my maternal grandmother's home, left me convinced that a sanctuary from the relentless push and pull of achievement and conformity had to exist or have once existed elsewhere. My research into the lives of medieval religious women beginning with the studies of Hildegard of Bingen and her Rupertsburg as a senior in college, has been dedicated to searching for this sanctuary. If I'm being honest, part of me has always hoped that I would find a monastic community akin to the one imagined for the 12th century poet Marie de France in Lauren Groff's 2021 novel, Matrix. There, women could pray and work unmolested by men. There, women could cultivate their skills and passions only at the direction of their superiors, with the encouragement and criticism of their consorts. There, women could exercise full liturgical agency, administering baptism, reading the gospel liturgically, preaching homilies, consecrating the Eucharist, hearing confessions, anointing the sick, burying the dead, and more. Such hopes have riddled my approach to medieval religious women with doubts. Perhaps my research is nothing but wish fulfillment. To make matters worse, my mind loops an offhanded comment made by a senior male scholar before the review of my dissertation chapter on the evidence for religious women copying, adapting, studying, and liturgically reading the gospels in England during the central middle ages. I am prepared to be skeptical, he said. I am sure that he does not remember this remark, but I still regret not responding. No one is more skeptical of the claims that I am making than I am. With every finding, I engage in a process of vetting that can best be compared to the medieval practice of discretio spirituum, or discernment of spirits. I conceive of every possible explanation for the phenomenon, and then, test them against my initial hunch to determine its likelihood. I constantly play devil's advocate to my conclusions, interrogating the personal desires that may have nudged their development. I'm not going to lie. The voice of this advocate sounds uncannily like the senior male colleague who questioned my findings many years ago. Fortunately, the voices of better angels, Margot Fassler, Kathy Hilkert, and Catherine Kirby Fulton in particular, resound in my mind too. Not unlike the Virgin Mary knocking out the devil in this historiated initial from the DeBrail Book of Hours. These women remind me that the skeptics' resistance to my reading of certain evidence may be motivated more by their own preconceptions and prejudices than by historical warrant. Such skepticism often cannot be allayed, no matter how much evidence to the contrary is presented. My efforts to recover the lives of medieval religious women have focused on their liturgical and pastoral ministries, theological and literary compositions, scribal activities, reading habits, and artistic creations. I found my research in the documents of practice and other material remains that survive from their communities. By explicitly prioritizing these sources, especially liturgical books, rochely, and fragments, I acknowledge my commitment to writing the histories of medieval religious women from the bottom up instead of from the top down. Too often, male authored prescriptive sources, whether monastic rules or conciliar decrees, have been read as descriptive accounts that accurately reflect these women's lived experiences rather than as externally imposed ideals or normative guides aimed at regulation or prohibition. Insofar as it is possible, I reclaim the voices, agencies, powers, authorities, and creativities of medieval religious women on their own terms, in their own words. In my book, The Care of Nuns, The Ministries of Benedictine Women in England During the Central Middle Ages, which I have the great pleasure of speaking about with Julia Federer and all of you this evening, 
I study the liturgical and pastoral ministries of nuns who came to identify themselves as Benedictines in England from 900 to 1225, primarily through detailed paleographical, codicological, and textual analyses of the books their communities produced and used. It examines three of the ministries most consistently denied to these women in the prescriptive sources of their day and in the historiography of ours, liturgically reading the gospel, hearing confessions, and offering intercessory prayers for others. To contextualize these ministries, I preface them with profiles of the officers usually charged with performing them in women's monastic communities, cantors, sacristans, prioresses, and abbesses. This book serves as a corrective to the established history of nuns in England by tracing the persistence of many of the ministries regularly fulfilled by these women in the 7th and 8th centuries into the early 13th century, including those ministries that became more clericalized and sacramentalized over the course of the Middle Ages. This book will always hold a special place in my heart. It is my first, and my complimentary copies from Oxford University Press arrived on the very day that our child Joseph was born. And it is the fruit of my labors as a graduate student in the Medieval Institute at the University of Notre Dame. Throughout my doctoral studies, my partner and I worshiped every Sunday with the Sisters of the Holy Cross in the Church of Loretto. The courageous, selfless witness of these women in every ministry they perform inspired me to reappropriate the term minister for the nuns featured in my book. The term minister was used in the text that directed and described these women's lives to, distingu to distinguish their roles and responsibilities, but it is rarely applied to them now, given the sacerdotal and sacramental connotations that have come to dominate its meaning. During the Middle Ages, the term's semantic range was much more capacious in its embrace of non-sacerdotal agents and non-sacramental acts. For example, the Benedictine rule and the grammatically masculine and feminine versions in circulation during the early and central Middle Ages defined a number of subjects and activities with variations of ministerium, ministry, ministrare, to minister, and ministrum or ministra, minister. Christ, the abbot or abbess and the celebrer were all identified as ministers. Disciplinary correction, kitchen service, hospitality to guests, labor outside of the monastery, and abbatial administration were considered ministries proper to nuns and monks. Every single member of a monastic community was called to become a minister of Christ, but often differently, befitting her or his rank within the community. Following the sources, I allowed the meanings of minister to multiply in my book so as to comprehend better the variety of liturgical and pastoral activities that nuns performed, both in their idealized forms and in actual practice, to capture most fully how Benedictine nuns in central medieval England understood themselves to be ministers of Christ. No less important to the argument of my book is the reclamation of the term cura monialium, or care of nuns. The dominant understanding of this term in the historiography on medieval religious women had been that nuns were always the object, never the subject, of the care given, usually by male clerics, resident chaplains, visiting priests, and diocesan bishops. Their surviving sources suggest that this care could encompass a variety of, of services, from managing land holdings and other temporal possessions, to copying books and charters, to hearing confessions, saying masses, or administering the Eucharist. But the care needed by, or deemed necessary for, a community differed according to its religious affiliation, location, venerability, wealth, network of association, and the levels of education promoted and attained by its members. In my book, I do not deny that such care was important, even vital, a vital feature of the lives of many women's communities during the Middle Ages. 
especially with the rise of new religious orders in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries, such as the Cistercians, Premonstratensians, Port Clares, and Dominicans. Thus, the scholarly attention that this application of cura monialium has gained is not unwarranted, but essential to recovering the histories of medieval religious women in their totalities. Nevertheless, studies interested in this application of the term too often neglect the other meaning it could and did convey, the care that religious women extended to themselves and to those who sought their hospitality, counsel, instruction, healing, absolution, and intercession. Such care was no less vital to religious women's practices and identities. Indeed, it is my book's contention that examining this meaning of cura monialium gets to the very heart of what it meant to be Benedictine in England during the Central Middle Ages. I want to leave sufficient time for conversation with Julia and for fielding questions from all of you. So in the time that remains, I want to share some of the most exciting findings featured in my book. Nuns liturgically reading the gospel and hearing confessions of fellow community members and visiting laity. Through close study of the corrections, annotations, and lection marks added to Oxford Bodleian Library manuscript Bodley 155, an 11th century gospel book from Barking Abbey in Essex, England, I uncovered the roles of, of nuns as evangelists in both senses of the word, as writers and proclaimers of the gospels. The alterations made to Bodley 155 had yet to receive scholarly attention, but when systematically studied, they disclose the hands of female scribes capable of transforming the Gospels into readings suitable for public performance. Bodley 155's many interlinear and marginal editions, which supply missing narrative details, alternative readings for ambiguous pronouns and phrases, pronunciation guides, supplemental punctuation, nooms, and other vocal cues like passion letters all indicate that this gospel book was produced and adapted not for private devotional reading, but for communal liturgical proclamation. The gospel book's many scribes were attentive to the demands of performance on both lectors and auditors to fashion a text that could announce the, the good news solemnly and clearly. Several additions made to Bodley 155 reflect unique features of Barking's liturgical practices and the devotional interests of scribes fully embedded within that community. Evidence gathered from other 11th century sources from Barking indicate that for much of the century, the, the abbey was served by a gifted scribe and sacristan named Wolfruna Judith. The peripatetic Flemish hagiographer Goslin of Sempertan recalled in his life of St. Ethelberga, that's Barking's founder and first abbess, that Wolfruna Judith had copied a missile of superlative craft. He called it the community's Optimus Codex, or best book, and observed that it was always displayed on the church's main altar. To the community's dismay, the missile was stolen by a marauding Norman priest during the conquest of 1066. Miraculously, though, the priest was forced to return it eight years later through the miraculous intervention of St. Ethelberga. This anecdote raises the possibility that Wolfruna Judith, or another barking nun of similar training or skill, was behind Bodley 155's transformation into a script fit for liturgical performance. Several rubrics found in Barking's early 15th century ordinal script the abbess as the lector of the gospel reading, most often for the performance of matins on Sundays and high feast days, but also on occasion at morning's chapter. The wax stains found on several of Bodley 155's folios reveal that the book was indeed used for liturgical reading, likely at the night office of Matins, when a lector would have needed candlelight close by to make the text legible. Though it is difficult to date these stains, they suggest that during the 11th and possibly the 12th centuries, the Barking nuns were liturgically reading the gospel, just as their successors were would. Evidence of nuns hearing the confessions of their consorors, as well as a, vid a visiting lady, is found in several of the prayer books and psalters that survive from their communities. 
the earliest earliest surviving example of a confession um, a confession form that scripts a woman as both a confessor and as a penitent is an early 10th century addition to an early 9th century prayer book from Nunnaminster in Winchester, now London British Library Harley Manuscript 2965. This confession form was subsequently repurposed not long after it was first copied to include a soror or sister. You can see it right here in the inner linear space here. As a possible confessor and as a and a peccator or male sinner as a possible penitent. These scribal editions allowed for a woman, likely the abbess of Nunnaminster, to assume the role of confessor, to hear the confessions of both women and men, perhaps pilgrims, lay associates, or patrons. Domini, de, Domini Deus Pater qui es vera Trinitas, Lord God Father who are true Trinity, is a unique penitential prayer that was added in the late 12th century to a mid 12th century Psalter from Wherewell Abbey in Hampshire, now Cambridge St. John, St. John's College manuscript C18. This prayer offers a remarkable witness to the textual productions of the nuns at Wherewell Abbey as both scribes and creators of prayers and to the types of confessions that abbesses were to recite publicly before their communities every year at morning chapter on Christmas Eve and on the first day of the Easter octave. Notably, the scribe who added this prayer also adapted earlier prayers in the Psalter for a female supplicant, as the slide shows. London British Library Cotton Manuscript Galba A14, an 11th century prayer book from Lemster and Hereford, contains several penitential prayers for use in private and communal confession. Two are particularly worthy of note. The first is the prayer Shushipe Sancta Trinitas, Receive Holy Trinity. The closest analogs for this prayer are the penitential prayers or apologiae that were said by priests after receiving the Eucharistic offering and before reciting the canon of the mass. But unlike any extant apologia from the medieval period that I've been able to find, the penitent of the Galba prayer is gendered feminine and is to identify herself as a peccatrix, a female sinner. The scripting of a peccatrix in the Galba prayer appears all the more surprising when read in the manuscript, because the old English rubric preceding it suggests that the supplicant is to recite this prayer at the Eucharistic offering. This prayer, one shall sing at the offering for oneself and for one's brothers and for one's sisters and for all those that one mentions in the prayer who are not present and for all Christian folk. Observe that the man referred to in the rubric along with its masculine anaphores, carry a generic meaning, and thus do not exclude a female supplicant. Indeed, the text of the prayer necessitates one. The second penitential prayer found in the Galber prayer book that merits attention is headed by the rubric Confessio Inter Presbyteros, a confession between priests. It is staged as a dialogue, but it is not between two priests as the rubric indicates, but between an abbess and her community, as the text of the confession makes clear. The abbess is to recite a series of confessions, each of which is followed by the chapter's pronouncement of absolution, Dimitat Dominus Omnia Peccata Tua, may the Lord release all your sins. In the manuscript, the statements of absolution were written in red ink to delineate the script of the dialogue more clearly. In one of the confessions that the abbess is to make, she is to acknowledge that she sinfully performed her ministries at the altar. Unworthy and polluted, I touched the consecrated mystery of God, relics, holy books, and holy vessels. Note that she is not to admit that she handled these holy objects unworthily because she is a woman, but because she touched them while still unconfessed, still defiled by the wicked desires and actions of the flesh to which she is to confess in the preceding lines of the prayer. Both the Shushipe Sancta Trinitas Apologia and the references to an abbess's ministries at the altar included in the Confessio Inter Presbyteros offer promising leads for investigating nuns' participation in the administration of the Eucharist. 
I briefly pursue these leads in my discussion of the ministries of sacristans and women's religious communities. The findings I present there recover the variety of Eucharistic ministries that nuns performed, baking hosts, cleaning vessels, bringing forward the offering during mass, preparing the altar before the recitation of the canon, assisting with the performance of the Eucharistic rite, and administering communion both at mass and out of reserve. Though I did not find any evidence for nuns consecrating the Eucharist, it should be noted that women were expressly forbidden from engaging in many of the activities enumerated above and the extant prescriptive literature. It is my hope that further investigation of medieval nuns' liturgical practices will illuminate more of their Eucharistic ministries. As with my book, I close my opening comments tonight with an invitation to fellow scholars of medieval religious women, to those who are just beginning their studies as undergraduates, and I'm so pleased that so many of you are here this evening, and to those who are experts in the field, to keep studying the extant documents of practice from these women's communities. There is so much we still must learn from the sources. We may yet unveil more ministers of Christ, charged with the liturgical and pastoral care of fellow sisters and others who sought their hospitality, counsel, instruction, healing, absolution, and intercession. We need only continue to search for them, confident that we are engaged in the necessary, painstaking work of history. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for presenting your really exciting research. And I know that you've been a friend of St. Mary's College in general for a long time, but also the Center for Spirituality in particular. So it's really wonderful to be up here with you tonight. Um, I, I want to ask you, um, I, you know, your book is really a corrective to the prevailing narrative about women in the Middle Ages. So and I'm conscious that I'm not a historian. So I want to try to narrate back to you a little bit about what I what I understood from from reading your really rich book. And and so um it, you know, it, it my understanding is that you know the early Middle Ages have often been described by other scholars as a kind of golden age for women, you know, that there were women doing all of these kinds of ministerial roles, but, um, you know, with the waves of Danish invasions over the late 8th and 9th centuries and the reform of monasticism in the 10th century, that that golden age came to a close. Is that, and, and, but you insist that actually the golden age for women didn't really end, that in fact, these women, um, in many of the ministerial roles that nuns once performed, even though they were gradually restricted to ordained men over this time period, nuns persisted in reading uh, the gospel liturgically. They persisted in hearing confessions. They persisted in offering intercessory prayers for people. So um, I just, I wanna ask you an open question about what, motivated you to look for a corrective to this dominant narrative that women just straightforwardly accepted the rules of an, incre an increasingly clerical church? That's a wonderful question. So back when, sort of the early days of the research for this book, I mean, I was, I was really enchanted by these incredible Benedictine nuns that we find in this earlier period in English history. Avises like Hild of Whitby um, and, and also Ethelberga of Barking, these women were said to have been avises of what are called double monasteries. So they were avises over communities that had both monks 
and nuns. And these women were incredible landowners, had vast estates that were under their control, but also were performing incredible ministries as well. I mean, we know that they were hearing confessions, that they were reading the gospel liturgically and and, and also administering the Eucharist. And, and often there's evidence too that they were baptizing infants too, especially in extreme cases. And so scholars knew this and I was really sort of taken with these stories and thought that, well, this is just really incredible. But I just uh, maybe hoped, but I, I had a hunch that somehow this, this history continued, that women continued to perform these various ministries, and that if we actually looked at the surviving documents of practice from these communities, that we might find evidence for this. But at the time, it really was just a hunch. And so I kind of went on a fishing expedition to England, looking at all of the surviving manuscripts from these communities to see what I could find. And I really did try to keep an open mind to just sort of see what was there and what I could unearth from those communities. And one of the first things that I ended up finding was actually the, the Galva prayer book, and it's in a terrible state. And so it, it belongs to what's called the Cotton Collection. In 1731, many of the manuscripts that belonged to this collection were really badly damaged in a fire that took place at the library. In fact, people that were at the library were like throwing manuscripts out the window to try to save them. And many were completely destroyed. Many are burnt little crisps of parchment. And, and fortunately, the Galba prayer book survived, enough of it survives that you can still read some of the text. And the first thing that I found that sort of just sort of jumped off the manuscript page for me was that Shushipe Sancta Trinitas, that receive Holy Trinity. And knowing that that belonged to this tradition of prayers that were um, usually recited by priests, I thought, well, this is interesting. And sort of things developed from there. Um, and, and I guess, maybe just thinking about my own training um, at the Medieval Institute, I tend to be pretty suspicious of these sort of like stark periods of time where we have, well, this happened then, and then there was sort of this great rupture that happened, and then things changed really dramatically after that point. Tend to sort of be interested in trying to find continuity across time, and just wondered if that it might exist as well here. And fortunately found it, and still keep finding more and more evidence. And Really, where I found my find myself heading now is, I mean, I sort of cut the book off around the year 1225, and there's a good reason why I do. There's the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, and we see, you know, papal power consolidating in really interesting ways that were, there, you know, the Pope and also cardinals and bishops and legates are sort of able to enforce the Pope's will more effectively throughout all of Western Europe at that point. At, things feel like they change a little bit, but the more and more I keep working in the later Middle Ages, the more I keep finding more continuities with these women's ministries. And so that's where things are heading now for me in terms of my research. I wonder if I could put you on the spot a yeah. little bit to think about, to, to ask you about today. So yeah. um, I wonder if you might feel comfortable drawing any parallels or talk about what parallels we might have today uh, um, in terms of restrictions on women's leadership in the church today. Um, I'm thinking a lot about the optimism that so many people had following, you know, in the middle of and immediately following Vatican II and, and thinking about how that um, has dampened over time, you know, and that especially with the reiteration of restriction on contraception, 1968, the reinstatement that um, priestly ordination is only meant to be for men and not for women. And as I read your book, I, you know, it, it really struck me that some of the ministries that you're describing these women performed in the Middle Ages, women are still not openly doing um, today in, in Catholic um, settings, right? So hearing confessions and things like that. So it struck me that, you know, we are more medieval than the medievals in a certain, is that offensive to say <laughs> no, no medieval? No. <laughs> but I, I just wonder, um, you know, I, should I be looking for the ways in which women are still persisting in doing those things still today anyway, and not pay attention to the official rules in the way that you do? <laughs> Yes. And not that I want to out any community of women <laughs> religious now, because I know the dangers of that too. But I want to say that I have been really fortunate throughout my life to be very closely connected to communities of women religious of a variety of orders. And it's been truly one of the greatest blessings of my life. 
and knowing the women that are a part of those communities, it's still happening. It is still happening that these women are performing these very important ministries and so much more. It's just we're calling them other things. You know, it's counsel that we're offering or, you know, um, even therapy. I mean, there are all kinds of other terms that are being used to try to talk about these kinds of really important liturgical and pastoral work that women religious are doing now. Just have to be careful about the way we label them, you know, thinking about the ways that communities of women religious have been investigated in the past, especially if there's any hint of any kind of impropriety that's happening. And, and yet I know it's happening. And I'm thinking of a really wonderful conversation I had with with a sister in the community, and I won't name the community, but she was talking about how one day she was walking with one of her friends in the community, and she felt like she really had something on her heart that she really needed to get off her chest, and she decided just to confess to her friend, you know, as they were walking, and that felt really appropriate to her at the time, and and thinking that this still happens, I think, in really important ways, and I think I think that witness of sisters has been really important to me in my work and has emboldened me to go look for this evidence in the past because I, I have seen it's still present now. Um, but also it has made me feel like more energized to keep praying, working for change now too. And, and I, I just want to sort of lift up the really incredible work that is being done by so many women and men too um, in trying to recover the history of women in the diaconate as well. Um, people like Phyllis Sagano, um, but others as well. I'm thinking of Casey Stanton and the Discerning Deacons group, and which I just want to mention that many of these women that are part of the Discerning Deacons groups are also alumni of the program that I have the great privilege of teaching in the program of liberal studies, which I think is really extraordinary. And that's really thanks to an extraordinary professor um, who was in our, in our program, Catherine Tillman, that she inspired so many of these women to go back and, and, and try to recover these important roles for women. And so women are still doing it. And, and we're calling for change. And, you know, and I think, I keep hoping with the synod on synods that's coming up, that we're being heard. I think there are many women in dioceses throughout the world who have been saying that we've been doing this work and we want to be recognized, you know, in, in, in a, an official ministerial role, in an ordained role. And, you know, just reading the, the most recent sort of consolidation of those various um, synodal reports that came out, the open wide, the space of your tent, it's being lifted up, those voices of women. And so I don't know what's going to happen. I keep praying that the Holy Spirit is moving in really powerful right, ways right now. But I don't know. I, for me, I mean, as someone who works on past, past, I guess my hope is that somehow, some way, this evidence will help but I don't know that, that that's, I feel sort of maybe sort of hidden in the mystery of God right now in terms of whether that's helping in any way, but that is certainly my intention. I want to ask you about gender a little bit more directly um, it, in, in your historical research. So I, it seems like you really present this complicated um, relationship between the ministry of nuns and gender. So in some ways, um, these medieval women in, um, you know, performed femininity in very direct ways. And in a lot of other ways, they subverted, you know, their performance of gender. So, um, I, I mean, just to throw out some details, you know, that I, I was struck by the ways in which you talked about that medieval people thought of the abbess not as a mother, but a female father. So it was important to think about her as mirroring Christ's relationship with humanity and ministering as Christ. But in other ways, it does seem like these women leaders were effective precisely as women. Um, so um, Goslin writes about Wolfhild, am I saying her name correctly, positively as a mother figure, precisely in her femaleness that makes her a better and more effective leader. So if I can read a quote from you quoting him, um, she did not know domination in those placed under her, but affection. She knew that she was a mother, not a Lord. She exercised charity, not tyranny. She carried everyone within her maternal womb, 
lactated with the breasts of heavenly desires and rejoiced to serve and obey her inferiors in the most abject manner. This sounds a lot like the way that we talk about effective leadership today, right? So this is kind of interesting. I, mean, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about gender. Yeah, I would love to. It's complicated. I mean, and, and I think, and I'm so glad you lifted up that quote, Julia, because so this description of Wolfhild, so she was the abbess of Barking Abbey, that's the community just outside of London. She reigned probably late 10th to early 11th century, really interesting figure. But Gosselin of saint Bertin, this he was a sort of peripatetic Flemish Benedictine hagiographer. He was like this hired gun that went around to different communities writing their saints' lives for them. He went to Barking and wrote, you know, wrote a variety of texts, but about really about Barking's three primary abbess saints, and Wolfhild was one of them. And so he's writing in the late 11th century about this saint that lived about a century before him. And so we're getting the information from him. So of course we have to be wary about the degree to which he's mediating Wolfhild to us. But also like Goslin sort of bends over backwards in his prologue to the work to say that he is depending on the testimonies of the women at Barking who are there today, verbal and written. And, and, and the one that he sort of lifts up most especially is Wolfruna Judith, that sacristan that I was talking about, that she especially had given him information about Wolfhild. And, and Wolfruna Judith was an exact contemporary of, of Wolfhild. So it's complicated in terms of the degree to which like he's actually reflecting the interests of the community. And of course, like this is their text and they want him to get it right because this is going to be a text that they read all the time, especially on the feast day for St. Wolfhild, but also maybe in private devotion as well. And so Wolfhild is being lifted up as this maternal figure. And, and that's really important for Barking to remember her as such. And, and also when you think about these communities of women religious, especially at the time when Wolfhild was an abbess, many people entered the community at a very young age. I mean, sometimes as young as three, you know, and, or even a little bit later. So they're being raised by the abbess as a kind of surrogate parent. And so that members of the community would see the abbess as another mother makes complete sense. And yet the very term abbess, if you think of Abba, father, and then this gets feminized, so abatissa in the Latin, so abbess, it still has that sort of Hebrew root to it that's still masculine. So you get this coincidence of opposites in this role. And so she also has to wield an incredible amount of power. And, and when you look at the history of these communities, they were constantly being interfered with by various bishops, especially who wanted their land or, you know, the patrons that might be, you know, bestowing whatever kind of wealth on them. And so these women had to be incredibly strong to fend off these various, you know, forms of encroachment. And, you know, and in order to do that, I had to act as a lord. And, and these women literally were lords too, in the medieval feudal sense of the term that they were lords of their domain and, and had feudal subjects that were under their rule in communities like Barking, but others, they were responsible for levying fees to raise knights in times of war. So these women had incredible responsibilities. And, and so trying to sort of balance the really sort of complex gender identities of these women is difficult. And I'll, I'll just say something just, well, this will be the last thing that I say. Something to, that I think a lot about is that these communities spent the lion's share of their days reciting the Psalms in Latin. And when you think about who the speaker of the Latin of the Latin Psalms are, but just the Psalms in general, it's a male voice. And when you look at the Latin, it's much clearer that this is grammatically masculine, who the I of is of the Psalms. And these women are appropriating that I every day. They're speaking, they think, in the voice of David every day. And, and that I is being modified by various adjectives and everything else by masculine adjectives all the time. And so when I look at prayers that are still extant from these communities, and when I see sort of various masculine descriptors still survive in the text to refer back to the supplicant who's praying, they're still masculine, but I don't think they had any problem with that. I mean, they're they're constantly having to pray in these masculine terms. And so it's just, it's really complicated, these women's identities. And I think 
the sort of more feminine understandings that they might have had or were natural. I mean, that sort of is coming from the idea of bride of Christ, and that would have been coming from their consecration as a virgin and also their profession as nuns. That would have carried through. But then we have all of this as well that's coming through just through the various texts that they're they're praying with all the time. And I don't know. No, it's something that just sort of came to mind in just thinking about it is Hildegard of Bingen was my first love, an amazing 12th century German abbess polymath. She has this really amazing liturgical drama called the Ordo Virtutum, the Order of Virtues. And in that drama, really sort of all focuses on this character, Anima, soul, who is being helped by various virtues, but she's being beset by the devil. And the devil is really trying to sort of lure her away from the religious life. And, but interestingly, toward the end, the devil starts going after the virtues because they're way too effective and sort of propping up anima. So he, he, when it's happening is the devil goes after the virtues and he goes after humility specifically. And he tells humility, you don't know who you are. And also worse, you do not follow God's command in the opening books of Gen the opening chapters of Genesis to be fruitful and multiply as you are a nun. And you do not beget children physically. And humility ends up responding, but yes, I do. That, you know, that I am, I am fecund in all of these extraordinary ways, and especially in the ways that I give birth to virtue, but also in the ways that I raise up these daughters in the, the religious community. And so, yeah, so you have that, but then all this is just, it's just always very complicated. So these women who are not able to have biological children. And clearly, I mean, these women must have been interrogated about that. I mean, why else would Hildegard put that into her play, that there must have been some kind of anxiety about this, that these women somehow weren't truly women because they were living this way, but yet they were something else. I mean, it was, you know, so it's like, yes, they are women, but they're also this other thing that makes them wholly unique. I'll leave it there. This, I'm sure that everybody wants to ask more questions so i would love to open things up to some questions from folks who are here this is really rich we could keep talking for a long time i would love that yeah <laughs> yes katie i wonder uh in the work of preparing this book, of writing this book, what were the most surprising things that you found out in your research? Things that really startled you? Actually, I think, I mean, just to sort of continue building on this question that Julia also asked, I think I was really sort of surprised by just the really sort of complicated nature in which these women were gendered by others, by but also by the way in which they gendered themselves as well. And I'll give another example. One of the slides that I showed um, was this really extraordinary document. It's called a mortuary roll. So when a community member died, especially if it was a person of a really high rank, like an abbess or a prioress, but this also was true for men's communities. But what happened is that an encyclical or letter was sent out to all the communities in that community's confraternity of prayer, basically like a big prayer network. And what would happen is that that encyclical would travel from community to community to community to community. And at each community, that house would write what was called a titulus. Basically, it was kind of a promissory note. And they would say, we will pray for the person who died in your community. But would you also pray for these people who recently died in our community? And they would write this out. And on the little strip of parchment, and it would be sewn onto the end of the roll and it would grow in length. And many of these are just, I mean, so long. Well, I mean, the one that I showed you has, I think it's 125 titulary that were added to it, but some have over 300 that were added to it. And so, and many of these would travel all over England. Some would even cross the channel over to France and come back. But the one that I was showing you was actually made sometime probably around 1225 for a prioress named Lucy in a community that was called Castle Headingham in Essex, so Eastern England. 
And interestingly, in the encyclical that was written for Lucy by her successor, and her name was Agnes, it's a really interesting moment that happens where Agnes is talking about all of her extraordinary deeds, you know, her that Lucy had done while she was prioress. And, and there's this interesting moment where she starts to liken Lucy to St. Lucy. And because because prioress Lucy took St. Lucy's name in religion. And there's this interesting comparison that goes back and forth between the two, you know, and how they were so similar to one another. But this prioress Lucy apparently had been constrained seven times by matrimony, but had never had never had sexual relations with any of her husbands. And this is contrary to Saint Lucy, had only resisted once. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so this prioress Lucy had outdone Saint Lucy. But more curiously, this prioress Lucy had engaged in such extreme fasting over the course of her life, and this is what the encyclical says that her bones cleave to her skin. And, and there, actually, it's a direct quotation from the book of Job. And so there's this moment where all of a sudden, Prioress Lucy becomes Job. And because, you know, it's not explicitly said that this is a quotation from Job, it's just given to her, that passage. And that image that I shown you, it was, it was Prioress Lucy's soul being taken up into heaven. And you can see that there's nothing that really identifies her body as a female body, except for the veil that's on her head. And, and so it's, again, just so this really interesting moment where just, I was really surprised by that history, though, you just to sort of see that. And, and it, I think it got me thinking more about precisely the question that Julia asked me, just to say that the, their genders were complicated. I mean, just like all of ours are. And this is no less true back then as it is now. And I think it was just another moment where I just felt like, where the Middle Ages all of a sudden felt really close again. Again, not to say that it's identical to our own, but it just where it felt like a moment of contact. You're welcome. Thanks so much. I have lots of questions, but I'll limit it to one for now. Um, your book is still relatively relatively young in the world, but in light of your call to other historians, um, that just, uh, that, that anecdote, anecdote about your own defense, I'm wondering how the book has been received thus far by other historians. Um, do you have any thoughts that you're willing to share with us about that? Yeah. So far it's been positive. I keep sort of like waiting <laughs> well, somehow like the shoe to drop. I don't know. And I think like all the time when I was working on it, and it probably is because of that. And it well, thankfully wasn't at my defense. It was just sort of this early, like it was like a dissertation writers workshop that we had in the medieval Institute that this, that happened. I keep waiting for that, you know, sort of this couldn't possibly be the case. You know, this is some kind of wish fulfillment. You're twisting the evidence in a certain way and it hasn't happened yet. Um, I think the thing that I've been really encouraged by though, is that, I've seen new studies come out that have been drawing on this, either the, the evidence itself to keep building on it or just using the methodology for other locations, um, the time periods. So I find that all really encouraging, really, really encouraging. And I don't know, I, I, I guess it really is my hope that the more that we give attention to these communities and really look at them sort of from the bottom up using their sources, and we're going to see their histories anew. And, and I think that's just my hope. And so because of that, there's so much work that still needs to be done. Maybe while we're waiting, I do want to say something for all the wonderful undergraduates that are here this evening. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, and I know it keeps coming up, I fell in love with Hildegard when I was an undergraduate at Notre Dame. And um, I think the Middle Ages can be forbidding in many ways because it seems like it's an accessible, inaccessible, um, that seems so other to our own experience. Um, 
but for, for so many of you, you extraordinary women that are here at St. Mary's, I hope that you don't give up on potentially doing that kind of work that might take you back to the Middle Ages. But also, I know your brilliant professors that are here at St. Mary's have told you that the history of the Sisters of the Holy Cross here are, it's really extraordinary. And, and I think so much more attention needs to be given to lifting up that history as well. And, and I think you all are in a really sort of prime position to be able to do that. The archives that are here at St. Mary's are just treasure troves of information, but also we have so many living witnesses here. I mean, this is a, a living community and getting to know the Sisters of the Holy Cross, it's been a great privilege in my life to get to know them. And I hope that will be a part of your experience here at St. Mary's as well. Katie, thank you so much for your talk today. As always, I really enjoy hearing about your work. And I wondered if I could ask you to pull back the lens just a little bit, see if you had any reflections on this sort of broader question of, it's a little bit selfish of me to ask, but uh, since our areas coincide so often, um, so many of the sources you've looked at have been these documents that arise within the community and they're very liturgical and they're very worship-based. I wonder if you had any opportunity to reflect on any of the women who were coming in from the outside world to be educated in the nunneries and then eventually would depart, whether they were sent there for education in the short term, whether they were there for refuge, and but they weren't permanent members of the community. Can you talk at all about what sorts of shaping they received perhaps in these communities and then took back with them, say into their royal roles or uh, off to other countries, other households, um, other courts. And if you've had any opportunity, if anything has come up in the evidence in your work to think about the broader impact, perhaps outside the walls of the nunnery, I would love to hear if you have thoughts on this. Thank you for that thoughtful question, Megan. Megan's the assistant director at the Medieval Institute and works does such incredible work on the literacies of medieval women in England, especially those that became vowed anchoresses, but not just anchoresses as well. And she's thinking of a great book on women's literacies in England. Um, so it's a wonderful question, Megan, and it's so complicated, especially I'll limit myself initially to just the time period that I'm interested in in the book. So again, 900 to 1225. There's bits of evidence that come out. Unfortunately, a lot of it's negative, um, especially when we look around the time of the Norman conquest of 1066. It seems to have been the case that some women, especially high-born women, even some royal women, were placed in communities of women religious, basically for safekeeping, because the worry was that you know, women's honor would be violated by these Norman knights that were coming across, and they thought, well, nunneries are probably our best bet to try to keep them safe, that they wouldn't violate a nun. But interestingly, there were women who ended up leaving the community after this. And we see Archbishop Lanfranc of Canterbury, but then Archbishop Anselm of Canterbury writing these really strident letters to these women that left, saying that basically they had committed an act of apostasy. And so if you left a religious community after taking vows, it was basically to sort of was completely renounced the faith and he would be excommunicated. And so he was, he, both of these archbishops were concerned about the souls of these women. And of course, it's sort of hotly debated. I mean, whether these women actually ever did take vows or whether they were just there and almost kind of like dressed as nuns so that they sort of looked the part and would sort of pass. And then ultimately they wanted to leave and, and did. And, and the fascinating thing is that in one of the cases, she actually ended up becoming the Queen of England. This is Edith Matilda and married Henry I. And I mean, like so many queens at this time, I mean, just incredibly literate and, and was corresponding with the most notable people of her day and, and continued to have close ties to communities of religious women as well. And you have to think that her time, and she was a part of Wilton Abbey um, in Southern England, that that must have shaped her in some profound way. So that's the first part I'll say. So it's it's challenging. And I guess one other thing I'll say too is that there's this really incredible collection of sermons, texts that probably were read at um, the office of collation. So it's kind of like an, 
an evening gathering of the community where they would read, you know, aloud edifying texts for the community. And there was a a book that was made in the 12th century. Um, it's now in the keeping of the Bodleian Library in Oxford, um, but it probably belonged to the community of nuns at Nunnaminster in Winchester. And we know for sure that this entire manuscript was copied by a nun because Fortunately, there's what's called a colophon. It was a kind of like scribe's like signature note at the end where she says, where she identifies herself as a scriptrix, as a female scribe. And the interesting thing about this collection of sermons, though, is that many of them are actually addressed to non like non nuns, you know, and it seems clear that they had in mind a much wider audience that would be listening to these texts. And the thought is that this community at Nunnaminster had a school that would have been there. But also, I think too often, like we think of these communities as being strictly cloistered. And what I mean by that is that they're completely sealed off from the world. So once you enter the community, there's no getting in and there's no getting out. And, and that's just not true for this time period. They're incredibly porous. And so we see women leaving and going out and serving, but we also see lay people coming in as well to be educated. But we also see pilgrims coming to these communities um, to, to pray at the saint shrines or whatever it might be. And so I think that's another moment where we see, I think, a kind of educational opportunity where we get the actual text that might have shaped these laity. And the last thing I'll say, Megan, and this is evidence that's coming from later, and I know you know this evidence really well, but I think something that's really fascinating, we have such strong evidence for this later in the Middle Ages in England, is the kind of cross-pollination that we see between lay women and religious women when it comes to the devotional texts that they're reading, and we see manuscripts being traded back and forth all the time. And so where I think we have tended to think of these as like two really sort of separate reading audiences, lay women, their interests must be this, and religious women, their interests must be this, and it's completely different from lay women. It's different. You know, we see this traffic back and forth between these groups of women, and it makes sense because if you think of like a woman in the Middle Ages, Middle Ages, maybe her aunt, her sister, or cousin is in, a, you know, in a community of religious women, and and remains, you know, close to her and sends her a book, and vice versa, you know, and so that they would have these sort of shared interests when it comes to the devotional text that they're reading it makes perfect sense to me, but the evidence bears it out as well, and so I think they're shaping each other. I think we've come to that time, unfortunately, where we uh, have to draw to a close. Before I extend a series of thanks, let me extend first an invitation to the next event that the Center for Spirituality is hosting here at St. Mary's. And it features uh, Dr. Julia Fetter, who is uh, with us here today. She'll be speaking on Tuesday, November 29th in this same space at the same time on the topic, God Beside the Cross, Christian Resources for a Spirituality of Resilience, the last of our three-part Developing a Spirituality Resilience series. So you're all most welcome to join us in person or virtually. But let me uh, extend a note of gratitude first to all of you who have joined us in person and virtually. Um, a shout out to uh, Miss Rebecca Holm, who is one of our student workers at the Center for Spirituality and helped set up today, to Dr. Julia Fetter, and of course to Dr. Kitty Bugish for taking the time to be with us, share your research and your passion for that research. I know you've inspired many of us, and I think there were the silence is probably the pondering of deep questions yet to be fully explored. So thank you for that, and thank you for joining us.